Well, I have to tell you that this is really a, a fabulous honor for me, and, and you'll see as I go through uh, uh, a few video clips and uh, a few stories that I'm going to tell you as we go through this that uh, as soon as I get my uh, mouse in place here, uh, that uh, it's, really a, it's really an honor. And the reason is, is that uh, I tell your story. I'm telling your story all over the world in the last two weeks, and I'm not sure what time zone I'm in, and it was uh, wonderful to spend time with your leadership and uh, last night and have dinner. I, in the last uh, week and a half, I've been uh, in Zurich twice, in Geneva twice, uh, Paris twice, San Francisco, Boston, and I've been speaking at each one of them, so I had to make sure I get my slides right, so I tell, but I've been telling your story and the story about how, how some of the greatest organizations in the world are going to champion and really be able to put forth the new innovations that are going to be the breakthrough innovations of the next decade. And you know, and I come from a technical background, as Bob had said, uh, radiation oncologist. Uh, I, I, my dad was a NASA uh, rocket scientist. Uh, I am a pilot. I grew up flying airplanes ever since I was 16, and I, I'm a jet pilot. So I really come from a background of the analytics. And today I get to talk to you about the soft side of things, which is story power and using stories to have impact. And it's because the next generation of breakthroughs in healthcare in high performance aren't gonna be software, aren't gonna be procedures, probably aren't gonna be imaging technologies and all of the neat things that I've had an opportunity to be involved with, it's gonna be you. It's gonna be leadership. It's gonna be leadership from the top and the front line. And the reason is that we have islands of technical and procedural greatness that are in a sea of system failures. And our system failures are where our patients are having harm and our caregivers, caregivers are having harm. So really, the fun thing for me in the next decade is that I'm studying uh, the concept of greatness in leadership. Uh, and who would have ever thought that? So I'm gonna be toggling back and forth from technical things and then from the soft side of, of things that I typically in my training would have just blown off completely. I start off a number of speeches now when I tell stories about you and other great organizations with this clip. General opinion is starting to make out that we live in a world of hatred and greed. Seems to me that love is everywhere. Often it's not particularly dignified or newsworthy. But it's always there. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, old friends. This footage was shot uh, by a hidden camera, which was in Heathrow Airport for a whole week. This was my inspiration, and I just saw these people just all hugging and kissing, and you realise that behind normal people in the park and in the street, there's all these stories of, of love. If you look for it, I've got a sneaky feeling you'll find that love actually is all around. So I can imagine that starting off with something like that from a technical guy is really, you know, that really catches you in a different direction. So I have something for the skeptics. Does everyone know what this is? Well, it's a lemming. From now on, we're not going to be lemmings. We're going to be leaders. Yes. So Jim, what are we? Leaders? Yes. Nancy, what are we? Leaders. Yeah. Oh. So this isn't a warm and fuzzy talk that's only going to talk about the soft side and then we're going to go back to work and say, what a waste of time. My objectives are really to talk to you about the new opportunity for greatness of the Mayo Clinic to address the leadership issues that revolve around some of our greatest leaders. What are the characteristics of some of our greatest leaders? And interestingly, uh, it's storytelling. It's the ability to connect the mind and the heart to put the hands to action. Think back when you were in your training, whatever field that you're in, is your most memorable experience that led to you here today a book you read or a story about a patient or a case or a great case that went well or a case that went south? It's a story. And it's a story that you tell. And when you, the greatest teachers, tell stories. Why? It's just the way that we learn things. And yet, we've really kind of avoided that. So let's just kind of talk about that. Now, I come to you as somebody who's just, I'm not a polished speaker. I mean, I, the last thing I thought in a million years that I would be going around and giving talks. 
the issue is, is that I'm asked to kind of talk about the work that we do and what we're finding out about these system failures that are leading to impact on our patients and why we can do a fabulous operation and yet we're 37th in the world in quality. I had to stand in front of 650 people in Zurich and take the place of Michelle Obama who was going to give a talk on healthcare reform and talk to these people in Europe and I said, you must be wondering why a guy from a country that's 37th in the world in quality and three times the cost of the other industrialized late nations is speaking to you and I had all these Swiss guys at the front kind of looking like this at me and I was like I was saying please learn from our lessons we have islands of procedural greatness but we are have patients and caregivers that are drowning in a sea of systems failures and that's the next generation of opportunity is to keep pushing the envelope on procedural excellence but also to say wait a minute we've got to look at the trajectory of the patients and Bob is working and 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 Steve Swenson and a number of great people from the Mayo Clinic along with uh, Harvard and along with uh, the Cleveland Clinic and others that are collaboratively involved here but I come to you as your student I I had my training here in intraoperative radiation therapy when it was a real breakthrough with Len Gunn Gunderson, Dr. Gunderson, back in the 80s. I, I can't believe it feels like yesterday scrubbing in here in Rochester. I'm your partner in that we're working on these national collaboratives to identify the givens, assumptions, and variables that we need to tell CFOs. I, I never thought in a million years I'd be talking to CFOs at this point in my career. Guess what? Some of the made major barriers to getting the funding for the procedures that we need to develop and the new innovations lie in the C-suite. We need to not be arrogant and say, well, I'm not going to learn that language. You're a technician if you don't learn your business and understand that you have to be a social entrepreneur now to get the resources to move to the ne next level of greatness. And then I'm your patient. I, ca I get to I get to see the data from all over the country. Where do you think I come for my care? I come here. And I've had great care, and I've had things fall through the cracks. So I know from the inside as somebody who's had some training here and also as a patient here and who loves the Mayo Clinic, I can give you maybe a little bit of a unique perspective. We wrote this article, Dennis Quaid and I and Julie Tao, and we'll make it available to you. We have the, the copyright authority to share it with you to address the power of storytelling. This was a great education for me. As I was learning about the greatness in leaders, and I'm studying that and we'll be publishing on the greatness of healthcare leaders, physician leaders, frontline caregivers, that every story has a victim, a villain, a hero, a crisis, and a resolution. Stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end, an act one, act two, and act three. And there's a real art and science of storytelling. So in this article, we talked, we targeted hospital leaders, administrative leaders, not clinical leaders, but it really does apply. And we used the, the metaphor of the story of David and Goliath, because what we see right now is, is that, and as a cancer doctor, I fall back to some of my training in grief counseling, the five stages of grief that uh, Kubler-Ross talked about, our country is is in a major state of denial about the system failures. Yeah, we're the greatest at this procedure. The patient had a great operation, but something fell apart when they went home. Aren't we really responsible for that? I'm cross-training radiology. You know, we kind of focus on the picture and the interpretation, but 40% of our imaging studies are, are inappropriate. They're either the wrong study, the wrong study first, or the in, incomplete information, but the report was read based on the picture. Don't we have a responsibility to how that impact of that study has? And the answer is yes. We're redefining quality now. ACR has redefined it. I think you all can have a chance if you can face your fears, your, the fears of, you know, are we not as good as we think we are? Um, wh where are the breakdowns? Am I responsible for that? So why do stories have so much power when we train residents? And when, whether you're a screenwriter, an actor, a, a novelist, a doctor, an educator, a doctor in the room with a patient to get them to understand. The currency of the mind is data, facts, numbers, figures. We're used to putting those up and, and talking about them, expecting that everybody's going to go forth and change their behavior, and it doesn't happen. We have a 17-year adoption rate of innovation in America today, unless there's a new reimbursement procedure code, and then it's embarrassing about six to eight months. The currency of the heart is emotion, passion, trust, love. Uh, the mind-heart connection mobilizes the hands to action. We wrote an article also about uh, that chronologued the public narrative that the Ob Camp Obama used to put the president, current president, sitting president, had such a grassroots effort because they used the power of stories to galvanize the frontline folks, and that's how they raised so much money. So if you get a chance, uh, I'd, I'd love to share that with you. I'm going to watch my time here, and I want to tell you a little bit of a story about the Mayo Clinic. Steve Swenson is one of the greatest leaders in quality in America, if not the world. He's, one of, he's, he's a Mayo 
type person. He's deeply humble. He's absolutely dedicated to do the right thing. He always defers to the other folks. We came here to shoot this movie, Chasing Zero. I'm in a Harvard program at, uh, where they picked 14 entrepreneurs from around the world and said, what if we give all the assets to Harvard and see if they can go out and tackle big social problems? I said patient safety was mine. Discovery Channel came to see us and I said, put my hand up, I said, I'm so tired of these negative stories about healthcare, about the gloom and doom and dateline and you're left helpless and hopeless and, you know, and I said, what, how do we get inspirational stories where we talk about the system failures but about great role models that do great things? And they said, you need a celebrity, you need stories that have relevance because that gets people to kind of watch, and you need relevance to our demographic. And so I went back and talked to Dennis Quaid, who has joined our organization to use his story of his twins to help save lives, and raised the funding. And I came back to Discovery, and I said, we're ready to go. I've got a celebrity, I've got the funding, I've got stories. And they said, great, but we need editorial control, and we're going to have to tell them the way we want to. And I just, you know prayed about it and held my breath and, oh man, Lord, I can't believe we're turning everything over to them. And then I knew Don Berwick was going to be appointed the head of CMS, a dear friend. He told me, I couldn't even tell my wife. And I said, you know, we've got to start shooting this. Jim Collins, the guy that wrote Good to Great and Built to Last, also a friend, gave me an afternoon, but only one day. And it was before we could finish the contract for the, for the movie. And I came here to mail because I was working with Bob and I was working with Steve and, and I brought our crew and we shot it. And they started to look at what we had and they, they fired their own studio and they called me and said, we're firing our own studio, just go make the movie. So we got the chance to tell your story. And Steve, and in the process here at Mayo Clinic, we found out about share rounds, how your nurses have developed a new way to, ch to check out at each other at the change of shift. We found out about a project of Bob's where they, you're measuring high contact surfaces with a rapid cycle uh, 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 device that actually allows you to look at the colonies. And, and your cleaning staff were uh, folks that had developed a checklist. And I met Dr. Noseworthy and I was interviewing him. I thought, man, this guy's a fabulous leader. He really gets it. He's got that that vision. He's really a great communicator. And the next day I shot Iris Crowder, one of your cleaning people, and I said, what's so important about Mayo Clinic? And she said, here at the Mayo Clinic, the needs of the patient come first. I thought, that's so cool. I was working out with Steve the next morning, and I bumped into Dr. Noseworthy, and it was dark, and it was like, oh, oh dark 30, you know, in the morning, and I bumped into him. I said, I got to tell you this story. And I could see his eyes missed up as I told him about your frontline staff knowing about your vision and your mission. So you know what? I never ask him. I pulled him out of this movie and I put Iris in. Because I know that that story could really galvanize the resolve of frontline people all over the country. That's the kind of place that Mayo Clinic is, a humble place, a place where I, there's no CEO in the country that I think I would have probably taken that risk to, to do. Let me show you the trailer for our next movie and then I'm gonna go through the storytelling piece and make sure that I'm on time for you. But this is the next, this is the next movie. The first movie, we can't believe it, we're blown away. 3.4 million people all over the world. I was at the World Health Organization. They want to distribute it to 192 countries. They're allowing us to create a toolbox that tells how share rounds work, and your nurses are going to tell that story. The folk that, folks that Bob work, uh, uh, worked with here are telling the story about this, this, uh, this uh, uh, breakthrough innovation that's really cool that anybody could use. Because in the movies, we can't tell them that you guys split the atom here, or you did a wonderful surgical procedure that only the male could do. We're telling stories about great things you do here that St. Elsewhere can do. Polly and Paducah, that is the only person in quality that they can do. That's the kind of innovation that you guys can export. Let me show you the clip of the, of the next uh, movie. Well, what we've learned in the military over the years is that generally it's relatively easy to determine what were the causes of, of accidents that, that cause loss of life. And we very passionately try to determine what led to that accident. And then we write rules very specifically to keep that from ever happening again. And we refer to that as every rule in the military has been written in blood. And that somewhere along the line, a mistake has been made that's cost somebody a life. And we don't want that mistake to ever happen again. The house is on fire, you don't have time to sit around and debate about which exit to use. You're going to have to get off the status quo immediately and get your institution turned around to a whole new way of doing things because it's out there, the methodologies are there, and the American public thinks we've already done it. One hundred thousand deaths occur each year in this country due to health care harm. 
making it the eighth leading cause of death. Now that's the equivalent of more than 10 747 jumbo jets full of Americans going down each and every week. And when you add infections into the mix that people get in hospitals, it doubles that number. That means that now 20 jumbo jets are going down a week, making healthcare harm the third leading cause of death in America. The overwhelming majority of healthcare harm is due to failure of the systems that support them. We don't have bad people. We have bad systems. Our support systems have just not caught up with the complexity of care. The good news is we can fix them. I think administrators need to look outside their industries for good examples. We took a NASCAR pit crew chief to look at our operating room turnover. They're very focused on safety and efficiency, speed of turnaround, similar to our ORs. We brought them in with fresh eyes to look at our operating room procedures and turnover time and got great suggestions and ideas and observations that we may not have seen. Hospitals are dangerous places. We're learning a great deal from the airline industry and other industries that have used systems engineering to drive out human error and provide systems in place to back up we as humans as we provide the complex things that we do every day in healthcare. There's been lots of crossover from uh, industries like uh, aviation and, uh, and nuclear power. How would you feel if you're getting on an airplane and you look to the left and you saw that there were no instruments on the, the blank? You probably wouldn't feel very safe getting on that airplane. Well that really is what it's like when a doctor sits down with a blank piece of paper in a hospital and writes an order for a drug or a test. We need to computerize ordering and that can make things substantially safer. I think we look at some of those new opportunities to move forward. Patients are getting more complex, another horizon we have to address. As you look at the increased complexity, we need to remember the basics. One of my themes always is stick with the basics. The enemy that never sleeps, that can steal away the very lifeblood of our communities, are support system breakdowns that cause 95% of hospital accidents. We're treating sicker and sicker patients faster and faster with a more and more fragmented care team. We're not just pushing the envelope, we're operating clearly in the danger zone. Leaders in car racing and other high performance activities like flying jets, military aviation, the maritime industry, and nuclear powered submarines have a lot to teach us. You know, just 50 years ago, we had a tremendous number of accidents in the aviation industry, military and commercial. And from studies of those accidents and the causal factors of those accidents, it's brought about change in the aviation industry. Flying an airplane is safer than walking, but there's a reason for that. In aviation, you have a lot of things to, to back up human error or to catch it, and to have more of that same type of innovation in healthcare. The epidemic of healthcare accidents is preventable, and ground zero in the war on healthcare harm is in the boardroom, not at the bedside. This quality issue is never going to stop. When we found out how far quality has slipped in all of our hospitals today, we were shocked. As trustees, we have the responsibility to bring the resources to bear to bring this quality back to the level that it should be and that we all deserve. Our hospital leaders owe it to our communities to learn from our greatest care institutions and from great innovators from other fields to prevent accidents and to protect our families from harm. These are our families. It's not just business, not just business as usual, it's personal. The real sweet spot or safety envelope for high performance care is the intersection of three systems, leadership, safe practices, and technology. When these support systems are functioning within the right organizational culture, we get great care and we get safe care. America has the means to dramatically reduce preventable harm to almost zero. So my mission is to drive awareness. Awareness of both the harm and the opportunity to save countless lives. It happens one little soul at a time. Now that always chokes me up because that's my four-year-old. Last Saturday, there were six patient advocates who had all lost families, and some of them are in the movie, and I don't have time to, to, to share that with you. And every other Saturday, we spend an hour together, and we end with a prayer for the caregivers 
that are currently at our great institutions that they will start to look at the system failures and be able to really look at those and humbly look in the mirror and say, is there a new level of greatness? And I was so honored last night to be with your leadership. And we didn't talk about how great you were. We talked about how great you'd like to be and what you, the barriers you'd like to overcome and the challenges. And I'm here to tell you, everybody's got those barriers and it's nothing new. And, but, I, but I think that there's something so unique about the Mayo Clinic. Now, when we talk about the healthcare story and we, we talk about that, that story, we have hospital accidents along patient trajectories. Our victims are patients, but they're also caregivers, which we address in the movies. The villains are these support systems. You might do a great technical procedure, but when that patient leaves or when they go home or along the way, that's where things break down. And we've been pushing the envelope procedurally, but it's in these systems that has a huge yield. And in the end game, you're a healer not just a technician. If you're a technician and you're just gonna do a technical procedure, great. But are you a healer? Are you a technician? Are you an educator? Or uh, you know, are you a robot doing things? And the issue is, is that I can look back and all of us can look back at the doctors and the nurses and the, and the clinicians that we worked with that were at the, the end trajectory of their careers and just loved the way they always did it and stayed that way and we couldn't believe that they didn't adopt the new innovations. These blind spots happen to all of us along our trajectories. The heroes, uh, the heroes will be the surgical and procedural physicians, administrators, and frontline staffs that can become a role model. So my challenge last night, and I don't, I, you know, I'm going to go right up to my time, but I may not tell you everything I had planned to tell you because I reconfigured my talk. I, I talk. I got up very early this morning, and as I shared last night with your team, you know, is this the beginning of the end of Mayo's unique greatness? And I, I don't say that because you're gonna get worse, I just say that you've already done such a great job at showing how to integrate people together to deliver great care. But is it the end of that because others are gonna to start to do, everyone wants to be like you, but are, are you gonna push the envelope? Is it the end of the beginning because you're gonna set a new bar and reach for the stars? This phrase down at the bottom is where the Apollo 1 uh, spacecraft burned up uh, on the launch pad, they still have it there, and there's a plaque. And my, I lived there when that happened. And my dad came home and said, "We, we, we had astronauts die uh, today," and I remember that. And that expression is there at Astra per Aspera. It's a rough road to the stars. It's not going to be easy if you want to set a new, a new bar. Now your crisis is. Um, uh, procedural success and systems failures. You're procedurally fantastic, but you're, you're, so, you're having the same experience as everybody else is with these systems. We're treating sicker and sicker patients faster and faster with more and more complex illnesses and terrible support systems at home. We have to do things shorter. Information has become really key and the fragment and fragmentation of care is not your fault, but it's a change in our environment. Uh, your villain is success. You're financially successful. You're great. Everybody wants to be like the Mayo Clinic. You know, that's one of the risks that you bear is being really great. And can you really look in the mirror and say, could we go to a new level? And I think the resolution of your story could be setting that new bar. So what if, what if you set a new bar for performance? What if you became a new role model for, for value-based care? What if you became an even greater center for others to come and learn? Your greatness will evolve, I believe, from reaching into the trajectory before the patient goes into the OR or the procedural room and far beyond because you'll take that responsibility to help us learn and understand how to be better. What if you did that? That could be terrific. Now, one of the greatest storytellers is Stephen Denning, and the story, stories have a great power in telling the stories of patients. This guy was a, an IT guy for the World Bank. He used to present uh, data and analytics about IT, and the people would glaze over and walk out. Then he threw away his PowerPoint slides, and he started to tell stories about the lives and the impact of lives of the people out there beyond their IT systems, and he was completely blown away and he became one of our greatest storytellers and teaching us about storytelling. We've now cracked the code on advertising and these are two guys, brothers, one guy's at Stanford, the other guy's in advertising, and they came up with a really, really good way to remember how the most powerful medium of getting behavior to change is through stories. Success. Simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional stories. When I told my story in Europe about our healthcare system, I took the August issue of our uh, US News and World Report. Now, paradoxically, it said the best hospital ranking, which we're all really proud of. On the same issue, uh, and when I talked to them about the harm that we have, one in 10 
patients are harmed by the support systems of the care that we deliver. Not the flagrant, flagrant reckless stuff that goes on. It's, it, it's just one of the new vistas of opportunity for us. Uh, in the U.S., we have 20 preventable deaths an hour. One in four families have had harm with an, from an adverse event, suffering a disability. One in three doctors. Two out of five imaging and laboratory tests are done because we can't find the prior, uh, prior information. And of 100 prescriptions that we write, only 60 get filled. And of those that get filled, one in four patients have an adverse drug event. 50% are compliant. On this issue, they, we talk about our great hospitals, but they talk about doctors over-prescribing drugs. They talk about the danger of healthcare scams, and they talk about patient survival guide in hospitals. Isn't that wild that the cover will talk about our best hospitals, but that's the message to our consumers? So how'd we get here? Come take a trip in my airship. Come take a trip round the stars. Come take a sail around 100 years ago, the Wright brothers Come had the inspiration to make a brilliant idea, take flight. Come take a trip in my airship. Come take a trip round the stars. a pilot enthusiast has got to figure how to get more airplanes in, but we've basically out-innovated our infrastructure. Our economic system in the U.S. has rewarded procedures by microtransactions, lots of fees for procedures and for new technologies and pharmaceuticals. I'm involved in all of that. The problem was we've never had a... Re how many reimbursement codes are there for IT systems? Zero. How many reimbursement codes are there for teamwork development and collaboration and leadership development? Zero. So it isn't any surprise that we're procedurally so far ahead of anybody in the world. And everybody knows that they want to come here from Europe to learn how to do procedures. But nobody comes here to learn how to develop good healthcare systems that integrate the procedures with the information management and the trajectory of patients. But they could. And if they did, where would they go? If not Mayo, who? You know, Dennis talked about the intersection of great high performance care is at leadership practices and technologies, engaged leaders practices that deliver, standardized practices that deliver predictable outcomes, and then the technologies that enable them. So I always love this clip to kind of help explain, and nurses always get a kick out of this clip. All right, girls, now this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her roll! <laughs> So we can relate to that. So there are two really important concepts about these, simp these, these system failures. One is migration of boundaries, and the other is normalization of deviance. What's happened is, is that we're tra the blue area is like traveling at 55 or doing the procedures the way that we've always done them. Increase the complexity, or let's say it's starting to get dusk and it's starting to have light rain, and you're traveling at 75 in a 55 zone and dry day, blue sky, then it starts to get dusky or there's a little bit of rain. Well, the performance envelope has changed for your stopping speed and safety, but you're used to all traffic's moving at that level. And then what happens? Uh, uh, it starts to get darker. Conditions change. That's what's happened to U.S. healthcare. Sicker and sicker patients, faster and faster with more and more complex illnesses. Very poor information management. A lot of things have evolved, and we've out-innovated the infrastructure to deliver that. So what's happened, like the frog in a pot of water, the temperature keeps going up. And what, what has happened, do you know that the number, the leading cause of sentinel events in America today used to be communication, the fastest growing, you know what it is? Leadership failure. Adherence to policies and procedures, new policies and procedures. I like the Warren Buffett clip. He gave me a great quote for a speech one time. Uh, the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to break. What's happened is the performance envelopes are changing all the time. The greatest leaders in the future are going to understand the risk envelopes along the full trajectory of care.
Isn't this what we do to make sure to fit? And then we have the enterprising finance guy coming in. He says, these guys are great. Fine, you're doing splendidly. Speed it up, Isn't this what we do? So we've led our infrastructure, our information management infrastructure along the trajectory of patients erode. And then when we come in with cost cuts, what are we doing? We are having further damage on the support systems. The leaders of the quality movement tell us that communication is a major component of almost every serious system failure. The following clip captures the essence of some of the challenges we face. Watch out! something very important, all right? Okay. I want you to run home and I want you to call the ER of North Bank General Hospital, 932-1000. Tell them to set up OR6 immediately and contact anesthesiologist Isadora Turek, 472-2112, beep 12. Have them send an ambulance with a paramedic crew, light IV, D5 and W, KBO. You got it? ER, North Bank General Hospital, 932-1000, set OR6 contact, anesthesiologist Isadora Turek, 472-211-TB12. I'm being with paramics and Lavi, D5 and WKVL. That's good. Sounds like a subdural hematoma to me. It does, does it? Well, it's not your job to diagnose. But I thought... You thought, you thought, just go! Three years of nursery school and you think you know it all, but you're still wet behind the ears. It's not a subdural hematoma, it's epidural. Ha! <laughs> enough said about how we interact as teams and uh, where we need to go. So our trajectories of care, I think, you know, everyone will make the case. Now, what happens to the great organizations? Jim Collins has shared in his recent book, How the Mighty Fall, that we have pride born of success, undisciplined growth, but the majority of failed organizations that have been truly great uh, deny their risk and peril. And mathematically, you can see this. And a lot of American hospitals are at this point. So as I close, I'll tell you about some of the stories that I've been sharing with, with organizations to move to performance. Can you really risk when the OIG report hits the street in the next 90 days about how much harm there is in America? Are you prepared to defend yourself and act like a BP or act like a Volvo. Uh, Merck, Ray Gil Martin, a, a great CEO. The delay with Viox, and why didn't they pull it off of the market? There's a recent article in the HBR, Harvard Business Review, that talks about decision making and not having all the information and looking how you're really performing and what is the real risk. Why did they do that? And so there's something psychological about this. So as we go through our healthcare story and we look at where we're going, we're moving from production-centered care to patient-centered care, from a hierarchical structure of administrative management to a team-based approach. Well, let's talk about what Bob and I and others are doing and get into some meat just as I close of what you could really do. We're studying the givens, assumptions, and variables of the clinical, financial, and operational performance issues, not just procedural, along the trajectories of patients in order to help the nation. So on the left is the way we used to do it. We, do, we deliver a great procedure. We have a hierarchical system. Uh, we're great, we're fantastic, and our publications show how great we are for that snapshot along the trajectory. But what about the care trajectory of the patient? What's happening with healthcare reform? 2167 is a magic number. Do you know what that number is? It's not the number of pages. It's how many times it says in the healthcare reform document, the secretary shall. And now Don Berwick is the head, who was formerly part of the quality radical fringe with a lot of us, and they're tying payment to the trajectories of patients. Can you all as the Mayo Clinic really afford not to look at the trajectories of your patients, go earlier than the procedure, after the procedure, and take responsibility? Because the winners in the system are, and that's where last night as we were having dinner, if not Mayo, who? Who has the organizational structure and the great, the, the, the great culture to be able to do this? I don't know, but there will, be, there will be organizations that do. So the patient trajectory and the trajectory of patient care is what we're focused on. These are some of the algorithms that Bob and I and his fellow are working on, where we're, we're taking surgical site infections and looking all the way down the trajectory before the operation, 
after the operation, what happens, what's happening clinically, operationally, and financially. How can we improve it? How can we coerce and get the CFO and the chief operating officer into helping invest into that trajectory? How can we get fellows and medical students involved? We wrote an art, uh, we, we sponsored an article that's in the, in the movie that we showed that uh, you all are a part of called Check a Box, Save a Life. It's a program where medical students, deathly afraid of harming a patient, looked at the numbers and realized that if they, used a, if they could convince an OR team to use a checklist every time, the numbers support across the nation, maybe not here, that you save a life in 144 outings using the checklist. It's the math. It's not every procedure, but it's the math. So as we look at these trajectories and we look at the healthcare spending, we are out of money. There is no question that finances are gonna get tied to quality. Transparency is gonna get tied to trajectories. I can tell you on our safe practices, Bob, as we look at writing the new standards, the new winners in the healthcare game are gonna do great procedures, but they're gonna understand where people are falling through the cracks. They're gonna figure out how to get a boat from this island of great procedural care to this island of procedural care and not let the patient or the family drown and not let things fall through the cracks. That's where high performance is gonna be. And it's gonna be, um, it's going to be leaders that are good communicators, that are storytellers, that leverage everything they can. Don't go read the book. Here, let me tell you about this case. Now, here's where you can combine really great storytelling. You take the data, the facts, the analytics, the trajectories, the numbers. I mean, I'm Mr. Evidence-Based. I mean, we had to write the 585-page National Quality Form Safe Practices set of 34 practices. We had to take it out to the marketplace. We brought it here to the Mayo Clinic because I love working with you all and we had 80 people from your multiple sites contribute to the 2006 version to make sure that we got it right. Did we miss a paper? Did we miss uh, any of the evidence? Is the, does it make sense? Is it reasonable? Would it work in one of your smaller hospitals and your bigger hospitals? And so we're detailed in the evidence base, but I have to tell you that we haven't been able to drive adoption. We know there's a no outcome, no income tsunami coming. We talked about the old mantra of no margin, no mission. It's getting replaced by a new mantra, no outcome, no income. The OIG report's gonna hit the street in the next 90 to 120 days. It's gonna be shocking. Don Berwick has seen it. He says it's some of the best quality research that's been pulled together. It's gonna to open the eyes of the public. CNN met with us after this first movie and they said, we wanna work with you. And we said, well, well, why? And they said, because trust, the measures show that trust in our American population is at an all-time low, and you have a good cause, and people want to hook themselves to a good cause because they don't trust their caregivers, they don't trust the bankers, they don't trust the infrastructure, they don't trust the politicians. But you know what? They trust the Mayo Clinic. You've got an ace in your hand because they trust you, because you have a great reputation. So my pitch to you is to think about continuing to deliver fantastic procedural care and keep doing that but invest in developing the support systems and the human system. You know, the last three feet of the healthcare mile is the caregiver at the bedside. Until we have robots, it's, it's people. Flattening your hierarchy, telling, having a nurse or a medical student or a, or, or a, or a resident be able to, to talk to the big dog surgeon and feel comfortable asking the stupid question. I used to tell my residents, the stupid question is the one you don't ask. But we've got a structure where for years, we didn't feel we could do it. When we see something going wrong, John Nance, who was one of the guys on there that was a captain for American Airlines, a lawyer, he's working with us on a new NTSB approach for healthcare accidents with Sully Sullenberger, who landed on the, the Hudson, and a number of aviation guys. I had the, the mixed pleasure of owning an airplane manufacturing company in the late 80s. And I'm telling you, any of you that think that you haven't learned enough from aviation are dreaming. I'm one guy, I'm a jet pilot, my dad was an engineer, I have an engineering background, I owned a company of airplanes that were aging, that were going down. We have a lot to learn about identifying system failures that can ruin your whole day. They really can. And I think the Mayo Clinic can do a terrific job as you go forward. I'm gonna watch the time here to wrap up, but this no outcome, no income tsunami in the article that we wrote about it, they're gonna be three types of players. They're gonna be players that get together and leverage the power of this focus on outcomes along the trajectory of patients. We call them the surfers. They're gonna make things happen. Imperceptively, they're gonna power away from the rest of the pack. Then they're gonna be the sinkers or the swimmers that get thrown in the drink. They're gonna survive, but the old luster of the past is gonna be, but, but we're great, but we're great. And they're gonna be thrown in the drink. And 
The surfers are going to make things happen. The, the swimmers are going to watch what happens. And the sinkers are going to lose it. And they're going to wonder what happened. And that's going to happen. And it's happened in healthcare over the years. We know that. And just look back at sterilization. Look at in your own field sterilization. The guy that developed it couldn't get anybody in his own region. The not invented here syndrome was there too, but also the barriers of leadership. They had to go to Austria where what? They had three things. Engage leaders, practices that they standardized, and technologies to employ them. And that's how sterilization came to be something you use every day. So we have to remember that we're not, we may be the top of the pyramid in today's market, but tomorrow's market, this no outcome, no income tsunami is going to be a major issue. The healthcare reform law, if it goes through, if we have a second term with uh, President Obama, nobody knows. But you know what? It doesn't matter. The reason is not because the safety geeks like me, they're out talking. It's because you run out of money. And where the money is lost is along the trajectory of care of the patients. And the opportunity for you, I believe, at the Mayo Clinic is the opportunity to start to study the whole trajectory of your surgical or procedural patients. Identify where things could break down. Create the opportunity to educate each other about the stories, new stories about how we can improve. Do what Jim Collins says, look in the mirror. Can we afford to look at the mirror and say, you know what, maybe we're not as great as we, we are. Until we've got some of these really common adverse events down to zero, and we look at other organizations and they got to zero, uh, we can learn a lot, a lot from them. And the way that we can make change and change behavior is really, it's amazing. I can't believe it, that stories have so much power. I am still amazed every day about how many people contact me after watching the movie. We're now developing one for the boardroom. And the, the, I'm going to watch my time just to wrap up here so that we have a couple minutes as you ask uh, Bob here at the end. But, but you know, the, the thing that I am just amazed with is how many people contact me after seeing that Chasing Zero movie and watching you guys and Bob and Steve in it and your nurses and the folks that were uh, uh, part of the team that measured the high contact surfaces. I can't believe how powerful that those have been to change behavior at the hospitals. And so we said, this worked. You know, I didn't aspire to be a movie maker, but I'm telling you, I'm so frustrated at trying to get some of these changes occur by doing all the usual stuff, writing papers and creating standards and having the evidence. It doesn't get the needle to move. But when people see patients and families that have been harmed and they go, you know what, I'm not gonna let that happen. They see caregivers that are criminally indicted for human, error that you and I would make every day, and they realized how unfair the system is. I think there's a great new opportunity for leaders. I think there's a great new opportunity for the Mayo Clinic, and I challenge you. I'm challenging you. I believe you all could become a global role model, not just a national role model. I think that, I know you're concerned with your own things, but look outside and think, well, what if? What if in three years that people came here to find out how to really develop optimal system performance and procedural excellence. Not pull away from your procedural excellence, but just add it to the complement because that's the new generation and that's where we're gonna go. And I really pray for you, hope for you. I'm your patient, I'm your partner, and I know you can do it. And I met the most wonderful people that I meet in healthcare are always at the Mayo Clinic. And I get to work with everybody. So I'll close and just say, I wish you the best, I know you can do it, and I know you're doing it in pockets. I just would love to see you just swing for this fence and not play defense during healthcare reform. As, as Bob and I have talked, go help change the standards. If you don't like them, you're the Mayo Clinic. You can change them. These are a bunch of people sitting in a room kind of debating about it, and you deliver care every day. You guys can do it. We can get you and the Cleveland Clinic and uh, Harvard and, and uh, Vanderbilt as we are in our project. You can change this. If you don't like them, get in the game because you're the Mayo Clinic. We're counting on you. Thanks.